Five is for seven winter quarter 2024. I want to apologize proactively for the volume for the recording in these first few videos. I'm getting used to a new microphone, which will be great because it will cut out the noise of the construction on my home partly, but it also is far more finicky than my old one. So be patient. My very first quarter studying history. This was my basic reading list. At the time, it seemed like a lot to get through in 10 weeks from my perspective. From my perspective now, it doesn't seem quite so bad. That's because I have a basic scaffolding of knowledge that it took time to build up. I can pretty much look at the titles and immediately know about the topic to see where each book fits in. But that absolutely was not the case when I started. I am also the sort of person who feels that it's somehow cheating not to read every single word and remember every single detail. After all, that is what I had been taught. So that you don't need to go through quite as much misery as you confront a history course, I have lecture two here, Tricks of the Trade, How to Approach a History Class, and Why. I start from a basic premise that a stressed mind is not a mind fully receptive to learning. There are some people who thrive on stress, but most of academia already caters to that approach. I cannot get rid of all of the stress in our lives, but I can help most of you manage much of the stress of history classes. I will give you five major pieces of advice for before you even start. We'll get how to actually achieve these in a moment. Number one, do not get stuck in the details. We all do it, particularly if material is new to us and we do not already have a framework of knowledge. Start by acknowledging how familiar or not you are with the material to yourself and adjust your expectations of what you want to get from things like a reading or a lecture. If you get more than you first expected, you're likely to be pleased and for good reason. If you expect to master absolutely everything we cover by March, you are likely to be disappointed. Number two, resign yourself to not being able to read every word or learn every detail. This goes for any level of study in history. Very few people in history can actually read everything that they would like to as completely as they would like to. The more you know about a time, place, and historical question, the more quickly you can get through any given source. But the more you know, the more sources you want or need to get through, and the more you realize what you do not know. Number three, approach everything in history, readings, lectures, writing assignments, from the surface or the biggest part, and then work your way through levels toward the details. This is basically a way for me to say, give yourself a break and don't try to take a ton on board if you haven't learned the context yet. Focus on figuring out the context first and maybe only for some material. Number four, don't feel like you have to enjoy every lecture or reading to enjoy history as a discipline. You will dig deeper into some topics than others, and that's okay. Number five, you are an individual with your own interests, your own experiences, and your own perspectives. Don't assume that if your perspective differs from your instructors, that you have to keep quiet. I suppose I would prefer that you not stand up in the middle of a live lecture time and shout that I am an idiot, but you can certainly talk to me if you think that I am off base. Students are not the only ones who learn in a class. Just don't shout insults, please. Now to the actual how-tos for reading history. How you read something will depend on what type of source you are looking at. The first document in the term project explains what these sources are, what these types of sources are, but I will also go through them here. A primary source is something produced at the time the historian is studying. Primary sources are often text or writing-based, things like 
court records, diaries, land deeds, household accounts, but not always. For example, photographs can be a primary source, as long as they were produced at the time the historian is studying. Secondary sources are scholarly works that researchers have done. In other words, secondary sources provide the insights and data that earlier historians have already created on what you are studying. And tertiary sources, that's a term not everyone uses, but you can think of things like textbooks. And I will explain all of these more in just a moment. A tertiary source is a synthesis of secondary source material. These may be textbooks, what are called state-of-the-field articles, or introductions to a primary source. Not everyone uses the tertiary source designation. I'm giving you this designation because you are going to be allowed to use tertiary sources for parts of your term project, and this is an easy way to identify and group them. I am recommending that you use American YOP, and you can see the page and the link there on the slide, as a textbook for the class. It's free. It's written by academics. It's fairly reliable. Although, as with any general source, you will not get a lot in terms of detail or nuance. The other type of tertiary material you are likely to come across in this class will be when you look for your primary sources. You need to indicate where you found them and cite any support or explanatory material you use in your report. If that doesn't make sense to you yet, just keep going with the class and you'll see examples of what I'm talking about. For tertiary material, look for the information you need. You will not want to read everything start to finish necessarily. Most of your reading for both class generally and for your project will be either primary or secondary. The first step is to figure out whether you have a primary or a secondary source or something that's a bit of both. A primary source is something produced, again, at the time the historian is studying. And again, these are often text or writing based, court records, diaries, letters, land deeds, household accounts, medical records, but they are not always text. I mentioned photographs before, those can be a primary source. Anything produced at the time that the historian is studying. Secondary sources are scholarly works produced by researchers. In other words, secondary sources provide the insights and data that earlier historians have created. When you want to figure out whether you have a primary or secondary source, start by asking yourself a list of questions. What type of thing are you looking at? When was it made? That is clearly critical to know because you need to know whether it was made at the time you're studying or made later on. Where did you find your source? The answer could be on a Canvas course site. Where you found something will be important to assessing whether your source was genuinely made when it purports to have been made. And finally, why are you looking at your source? And the answer could be because it was assigned to me in a class. We will look at two books so that you can see how to decide whether each is a primary or secondary source. The particular copy of the book on the slide here is recent, but the text was originally published in 1861, long enough ago that you would start thinking primary source immediately. When you find out who the author was and why they wrote the book, you know this is the primary source. The author is not a recent scholar, and the book presents the story of the writer's life and a critique of slavery. This book is loaded with information, but it was not written for the purpose of conveying the results of scholarly analysis. Primary sources are the materials that historians analyze. You will be learning how to tackle primary sources throughout the quarter, but I will use the Columbus piece in your module readings to start you thinking about how to approach a primary source, and I'll do that in a couple of lectures, not in this one. This book 
was published in 2010, so it's fairly recent. The author is an historian and, in fact, is in the history department here at UC Davis. This book examines the past, the 1930s, but it is an analysis of why things happened the way that they did. This work is based on the analysis of both primary and secondary sources. So let's say that you are looking at a secondary source. What next? How do you read it? Determine what type of secondary source you are looking at. You are most likely to have one of the following. An historical monograph or book. Mono means single, graph means right. So a monograph focuses on a single historical question. You may have a chapter in an edited volume, or you may have a paper that appeared in a professional journal. If you have a secondary source, it will never, 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 never be a novel. Novels are works of fiction intended primarily to entertain the reader. Almost all legitimate scholarly works have been what's called peer review. We do not get to publish whatever we want. Publishers and editors review work to make certain that it is actually valid work that contributes to the field before any secondary source comes out in print. Be aware, there are things that are not secondary sources, but that can fool you. These include articles in popular magazines, newspapers, and websites. Your approach and expectations for these sources will be different than they will be for scholarly historical sources. We will talk about how to use these types of sources another time, maybe. Now, if these were produced around 20 or more years ago, some of these could be primary sources, although not for the time period covered in this class. Assuming that you do have a bona fide secondary source, what do you do next? Remember, you are an honorary historian as long as you are in this class, and historians cannot read everything we need, much less everything we want to read. I think that this image on the slide was probably taken in a bookstore, but to be honest, it could easily be my home. Spouse periodically complains about the obstacle course, which changes nothing. Historians know that other historians cannot read everything all the time. Historical works, whether monograph, chapter, or paper, are constructed with the idea that the reader is going to gut, G-U-T, gut, the text. What exactly is gutting? Well, first, it is not the same thing as skimming or scanning a reading. It's a very particular way of approaching just go with me here. This analogy is ridiculous, but I have found that the ridiculousness actually makes it easier to remember the process. I'm going to spend some time on gutting because it will make your life in history classes both more pleasant and more efficient. Gutting, regardless of the length of the text, a secondary historical source is a fish. Step A in gutting secondary sources in history is to Look at your fish. Don't ignore titles. They can be quite informative. Who wrote the book, chapter, or article that you have? What is their scholarly affiliation? Are they trained in history or in another academic field? When did they write the book or paper or chapter? The gutting method is basically the same, so I'm likely to just say book sometimes from here on. How long ago was your text written? relative to the time that you are reading it. There are always at least three levels of historical context to keep in mind for a secondary source. The historical context being analyzed, the historical context in which the text was written, the writer or scholar's historical context, and our own historical context as the reader. We will be revisiting that last one throughout this course. It is critical, especially for time periods leading into our own, to remember that the historical context is not the same as our own. It may be recent. It has almost certainly shaped our world now to some degree, 
but it is not our world now. And that matters. Back to gutting your source. Step B, scale your fish. Look at the table of contents if you have a book. It will tell you more than page numbers. Read the names of the chapters. Is the book primarily organized chronologically, meaning by time, or thematically, meaning by analytical basis? Just looking at the table of contents, you will be able to see how the author has organized their book and the type of story they are going to tell. This also works for papers. Look at section headings if the paper has them. And early hint, this also works for my class and each of my lectures. That's what the syllabus and the outlines at the beginning of lectures are for. Cut off the head of your fish. This is stage C. Read the beginning or introduction of your text. Sometimes, like in the example on the slide, it's already labeled for you as introduction. Otherwise, it is usually the first chapter for a book or the first paragraphs for a paper. Once you have read the introduction, you should know the when, where, who, and what that the book or text will examine. And you should have at least some idea of the why question the author will be answering in their text. Step D, do not just move back through your fish from the head end. And don't read your history text in order from the introduction through the rest of the book unless you have a lot of time on your hand. Instead, cut off the tail, meaning read the conclusion of the book. Sometimes it is obviously labeled, like here, and sometimes you have to figure it out. It's the last paragraph or two of a paper or short book and the last chapter of text in most books. By the time you finish the conclusion, you should know the why question the author has answered in the book and what their answer is. In other words, the big argument that the author is making. The argument is the entire point of historical writing. The story told and the sources cited are the evidence and experimental results to historians. An argument is not an opinion when it comes to history as a discipline. An argument is not just what the historian thinks about a topic. That might be a starting hypothesis. But in history, the argument represents the conclusions that an historian has drawn based on close study of their available data. Going back to stage D, cutting the tail off your fish, for some texts, you will only ever gut them to this stage. If you want to go to an author's talk, but you don't have time to read their entire book, the talk is in an hour and you've only just got your hands on the book, getting this far through gutting is enough to orient you for the talk. Assuming that you are moving on, though, remove the viscera, stage E, remove the viscera from your fish. Viscera are the internal organs, or appropriately here, the guts. For a book, removing the viscera means doing a mini gut on each chapter or section. Read the chapter and section titles, topic sentences, and the first and last paragraphs of each chapter or section. This gives you the how, how the historian has backed up their conclusions, how they reached their conclusions. The author anticipates the questions an informed reader is likely to ask before that reader will be convinced by the author's main argument. This step lets you figure out the lines of logic and reasoning that the author is using in answering those questions. The process of gutting is not the same thing as skimming or scanning, and here's why. In gutting, you do want to pause and think as you work through the text, and you do want to read some parts in depth. Once you get to this step, you know enough about the text to be able to find material for a paper or discussion question quickly and efficiently. If a text is extremely important to your research interests, you will take your fish apart more thoroughly. You will want to cut out the fillets, meaning figure out what type of evidence is the scholar using. 
For historians, evidence is drawn from a mix of primary and secondary sources. You will need to consider what the type of sources used can tell you about how your scholar will go about proving their points to support their argument. For people new to history, and that includes me when I was new to history, footnotes can seem like a bizarre vestige of outdated historical presentation. But for historians, the footnotes are our materials and methods section. They can lead us to other secondary sources or to new archives that could be incredibly useful to us. You will sometimes encounter endnotes. Endnotes are the same thing as footnotes, but they are at the end of a paper chapter or book instead of at the bottom or the foot of the pages. At this point, decide whether you want to cook and eat any part of your fish. This means that you decide if you want to read a text or any part of it closely. This is a personal calculation you will make based on your own interest, reason for reading, time, and energy. You can always freeze some or all of the fish to eat later. In other words, you remember enough about the book to know when it will be useful to you and keep it or notes on it where you can find it when you want it. Dead tree books you put on shelves or stacked on your floor if you're me, and electronic material archived with notes will allow you to find what you need a year or more later. You cannot remember everything in every book unless you're that one person with a photographic memory. But you can remember which book or paper had that information or argument that would be really useful to you right now. If you are still going with your text, cook, eat, and enjoy. Read what interests you the most or what will help you answer a question or do your project more closely. Dig into those details I made you skip over before. If you follow the basic rules and order of preparing a fish, you will enjoy it much more than if you try to drop it whole and raw into your mouth. If you follow the basic rules for reading history, you will enjoy history classes far more than if you try to read every word of every text from beginning to end. The key idea here is that historians expect other historians to gut their work. So they organize their writing in order to facilitate gutting. You will be learning what that means for you as a writer when we get on to the stages of your term project, especially if you decide to do an analytical essay. Helpful hint, history lectures and courses are also constructed for gutting. If you look over my list of lectures, even though it is tentative and open to change some, you will have a general understanding of where I am going with this class and how I intend to get there. For each lecture video, I will give you an outline towards the beginning and key points at the end. It is okay to use these like the chapter headings and the concluding section in a book. Just don't try to work with only the outlines and the key points. You will need at least some of my substance to get through the class. One more word of advice. I am the historian author for this class. Keep in mind always that your own historical context and the historical context of your historian, here that would be me, think about their motivations and perspective at every step. So I've given you some questions here. Why? Why is my instructor giving me this example? And I will tell you, it's never just because I feel like making you read something. And I always think it will have some benefit to your understanding if you choose to read it. Why has the instructor chosen this particular topic? Why have they given me this reading? Why have they stressed these points? And then what? What point is the instructor trying to make? What does this tell me about the historical arc of the course? And what do I personally get out of this material? Don't leave yourself out of this calculus. The course is for you. You will start practicing gutting and organizing material that way in your mind for the first stage of your term project. Even if you only make it to the gutting stage D, cutting off the tail, you will at least know what the text is about. You will also know where to find information quickly 
for discussions, papers, and questions. Knowing the basic historical context being studied and understanding the historian's argument is far more important than details of evidence for you at this stage. All of the material on the slide here is included in the directions and materials for stage A of your term project. You can access this through the homepage on the Canvas course site, term project module, or through files. Your term project will be an exercise in communicating history that you discover for yourself. You will have a choice of styles to use when presenting what you learned in your project this quarter. Regardless of the form of presentation that you choose, you will want to make a point about what you've learned, not just give your audience a lot of data for no clear reason. For that, to have a point, whether you choose to do an analytical essay or something geared more towards a general audience, you should look at the first sections, at least, of my writing guide under Files. The basic skeleton, your organization, will be the same regardless of your presentation format. The bells and whistles of your presentation will depend on the audience that you want to reach. For a general audience, I've given you some examples of YouTube history videos. We don't all react the same way to the same style. So as you watch these, don't just think about the information in them, but also think about the structure and presentation of each. What works for you and what doesn't? This will be your project and you will want to communicate in a way that is both comfortable for you and accessible to the audience that you want to reach. Key points for lecture two. Do not get stuck on details. Make certain that you have a big picture scaffolding in your head before you start trying to fit details into it. Know how to distinguish between a primary source, one created in the past during the period that you are interested in, and a secondary source, an analysis of something from the past done by a scholar. Know how to gut a secondary source so that you understand the analysis and big point presented by the author and don't get stuck in unfamiliar or familiar, as the case may be, details. This is not cheating. It is an efficient and effective way of approaching reading. Historians expect you to gut their work. Understanding the guttable format will help you with reading, taking notes on lectures, and doing well on your own writing assignments in most history classes. When communicating history, you generally have an overarching point that you want to get across to your audience. The nature of that point and the way that you present it will depend on the audience that you are trying to reach. Start thinking about what interests you that you might want to focus on for your term project, what sort of audience you want to reach, and how you want to share what you learn. Finally, the coda for this lecture is super short. This is a fish made of pennies. I don't know how you would gut it, but there it is.